Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Furlong and today we're talking die hybrid crosses. In a previous video we looked at Punnett squares or monohybrid crosses. We just looked at one trait at a time and we made a simple four box Punnett squares. But in a dihybrid cross we might want to take a look at two different sets of alleles and their chances of combining together. In that case we would have to do a dihybrid cross and so what we're really doing is determining the chance of two independent events occurring together. So let's take a look at an example of this. I'm going to use a, some hypothetical traits in some ferocious animal here. Well, there's a drawing of one of these. Gray fur is a dominant trait, so I'm going to use a capital G to represent the gray fur. The white fur is a recessive trait, so we'll use a lowercase g to represent that one. Now if we look on their ears, they don't have any coloration on theirs. It's the, actually, it's the same as the rest of the fur on their body. That's the normal color. So I'm going to use a capital E to represent the normal ear color, which means that it just is the same as the rest. Some of these have black ears. It's different than their fur color. So we, that's the recessive. And we will... I use a lowercase e for that one. So let's cross two of these bunnies. Let's give them some genotypes. Let's say that both of these bunnies are heterozygous for both traits. In other words, they are both have gray fur and the normal colored ears, or the ears that match their, the rest of their fur. Let's mate these two. Aww. Now we have to show all the different possible combinations that they can pass these two alleles on to their offspring. Remember, they have four alleles, but they're only going to pass two on, one from each trait. So they're going to pass on one G and one E. How do we determine which G and E gets passed on? Well, we're going to use something known as the FOIL method. I'm sure you've heard of this in your math class. We're going to be using the same acronym where F means first, O is outside, I is inside, and L is last. So for instance, in this example, they both have the same genotypes. We could say that the first G and the first E will be paired together. So that's one possible outcome. It could be the outside G and the outside E is the pairing that occurs. It could be the inside G and the inside E that gets paired up, or it could be the last G and the last E that gets paired. So let's put this into our Punnett square. This time we're going to make a dihybrid cross. This is a larger version of the Punnett square we made before. So you're going to make a very large box. Make sure you give yourself plenty of room on your paper. Now in a monohybrid cross we simply divide this up into four smaller boxes. This time we're going to divide up into 16 smaller boxes. That's right, you heard me, 16, because there's going to be 16 different outcomes. And we know that the parents were heterozygous for both traits. So I'm just going to jot this on here. And we need to use the FOIL method to find out, well, what letters are we going to put above each row and in front of each column? So we take one parent again, do this one at a time. We know that one G and one E has to be put in each of these spots, but which G and E? Well, in one of these, it's going to be the first G and the first E. In the second one, we're going to put the outside G and the outside E. In the third one, we're going to put the inside G and the inside E. Now notice, even though E is dominant, I'm keeping the E second, the G's first. And then the last G and the last E. The same thing is happening with the other parent. First G, first E. Outside G, outside E. Inside G inside E, and then the last G and the last 
E. So in each of these boxes now, I'm going to have four letters. I want to keep my G's and E's together. So for instance, this would be big G, big G, big E, big E. In the second box, it's going to be big G, big G, big E, little E. In the third box, big G, little G, big E, big E. And in the last box in this first row, big G, little g, big E, little e. So you see how this was all combined. We have two dominant alleles for G, two dominant alleles for E. Two dominant alleles for G, one dominant, one recessive for E, and so on. What I'd like you to do is take a few minutes. You may, well, you'll need to pause the video and fill in the rest of your Punnett square. Once you have that done, we're simply going to look at the phenotypic ratios. You'll see there's a whole bunch of genotypes here. I'm not ever going to ask you for a genotypic ratio. However, what you might want to do is on the side have the two traits together and we're going to make some tally marks. So I have written down the four possible outcomes for this trait. There's always going to only be four possible outcomes. And we simply go through and we're going to read each box and identify what the phenotype is. So for instance, in this first box, it's going to be gray fur, normal ears. I'm just going to put a tally mark there. Second box, gray fur, normal ears. Another tally mark. Gray fur normal ears, gray fur, normal ears. In the second row, gray fur, normal ears, getting lots of those, gray fur, black ears, tally mark there, gray fur, normal ears, another one, gray fur, black ears. Third row, gray fur normal ears, gray fur normal ears, white fur normal ears, white fur normal ears. Last row, gray fur normal ears, gray fur black ears, white fur normal ears, and white fur black ears. In order to find our phenotypic ratio, we just now have to do the counting. We had nine gray fur normal ears, three gray fur black ears three white fur normal ears, and one white fur black ears. So our ratio, nine to three to three to one. And that's all it is. You have to be very careful when you're setting this up and how you're reading these. Simple mistakes can be made all the time. One of the things that you can do to check do all of your numbers add up to 16 because there's only 16 possible outcomes. 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 does equal 16. So in doing these, just again, best advice, take your time, do it methodically, one row right after another, write out the four different possible phenotypes, and then just start counting them one at a time. Don't lose your spot in that process of counting them. And pretty soon you have a whole bunch of bunnies. You're going to be getting lots of practice doing dihybrid crosses. Once you've done a few of these and you've practiced them, you're going to find out that although it looks very complicated, it's a very simple thing to do. And I'll see you in class.